It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is for the Premier. You know, for weeks, the Premier has been saying that all the decisions that he is making uh, have been made on the advice of experts that sit around his COVID-19 command table. So my question is, will the Premier actually tell us today exactly who those experts are? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you. We have been very clear about who's involved in the uh, table from the very beginning. Of course, it's Dr. Williams, our Chief Medical Officer of Health. We also have Dr. Uh, Heyer, who is helping with the outbreak management, uh, Dr. Yaffe, who's also appeared and spoken in on many contexts, as well as many other physicians. But it's also important to note that as we developed our fall preparedness plan, Keeping Ontario Safe, we conducted consultations with over 45 groups, including over 300 experts in all aspects of our health care system. So our fall preparedness plan was not something that came from one or two people. This was something that was done in conjunction with all aspects of our health care system, including the people that are on the public health measures table. The supplementary question. Uh, well, back to the Premier Speaker. For months, the Premier has said, and I quote, you'll know what I know, when I know. That's exactly what he said. You'll know what I know when it comes to COVID-19. Yet the government refuses to say which long-term care homes are at high risk, which workplaces have had outbreaks, and which experts the Premier is consulting uh, behind the scenes at his COVID-19 command table. So what possible reason, what possible reason could this Premier have for not telling us the information that people deserve. Why is he keeping these things secret? The Deputy Premier. There is nothing secret here. We have been straightforward and transparent with the people of Ontario with every step that we have taken throughout this COVID-19 outbreak. We have talked and we have brought forward the experts. Today, there was a, a release of modelling information. As the Premier has always indicated, when he knows it, the people of Ontario will know it. And that's what's exactly happening now. That modelling information has been brought forward. Order. The uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health comes to uh, almost every briefing that we have at 1 o'clock. Uh, there is a presentation. I understand that uh, you have asked for an update, and that will be provided to, uh, to you and to the other leaders of the other parties this afternoon. That information is going to be provided. It's important that everyone know the decisions that are being made and why they are being made. That's why it's so important to have this information come forward. Response? And we're prepared to answer any questions that you want to ask about it. The final supplementary. You, you, you can't pick and choose transparency. This is not the case. We have asked questions about who's at the command table. They refuse to answer. We have asked questions about which long-term care homes are considered high risk. They refuse to answer. We have asked questions about outbreaks in, in employment uh, areas, in, in, uh, uh, in workplaces. They refuse to answer. So that's what we're asking for. We're asking for transparency across the board, not just when this government picks and chooses to, to put out a tidbit of information. He says he listens to experts, Order. the Premier says that, but now we're unprepared for a second wave because the Ford government ignored experts for months, for months in schools, in long-term care. We're literally writing the Premier and saying, we are not prepared for a second wave, and now here we sit. Experts in public health and hospitals warning the Premier that the hospital testing system was ready Question. for a crash, yet the Premier still insists that he has his own experts. Why is he refusing to be transparent and tell people, tell all of us, who those <laughs> experts are? Minister of Health. First of all, we have been open and transparent with this information. We have brought the doctors forward. We know that it is very important to the people of Ontario to hear not just from us as politicians, but from the doctors about what the situation is on the ground. And those doctors have come forward. Dr. Yaffe's come forward. Dr. Williams has come forward. Dr. Allen, Dr. Brown, Dr. Heyer, and the list goes on. Those are the people that are at the public health measures table, but we've also consulted more widely than that. We've consulted with the Ontario Hospital Association. 
Association. We've consulted with the Ontario Medical Association, who's just come forward with a report advising us of their recommendations with respect to COVID-19 and dealing with the second wave. We are acting on those recommendations. And I would also like to point out that the OMA stated in their report that the government should stay alert and adapt to evolving science and take an iterative, of pro iterative approach to Response. developing guidelines and recommendations as new research, evidence, and data emerges. And that is exactly what we are doing. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Yesterday, three more families learned that their loved ones died in Ontario long-term care homes from COVID-19, in Ottawa's West End Villa and in Toronto's Fairview Nursing Home. At least 46 homes now have COVID-19 outbreaks, a number that has doubled in the last week. Will the Premier accept any responsibility for his failure to put measures in place that could have actually saved these lives? Mr. Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you uh, to the... Just waiting for my mic. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. You know, I am deeply troubled when I see members of the opposition laughing and smiling about this. This is a serious, this is a serious Order. issue. When I see people smiling and laughing Order. about this, I, I am. Order. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Order. Order. I'm going to caution all members on their, their language and uh, the statements that they're making so as to ensure that we have a civil question period for the next 53 minutes. Start the clock. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Our government puts the safety and well-being of residents and staff as a priority, and all the measures that we've taken with public health, with Ontario health, with the, the public health units uh, in the various locations. These are measures that are ongoing with the command table. We look at the number of outbreaks, and I want to emphasize this point again, that the vast majority of outbreaks we have right now have no resident cases. Response. Our surveillance system is working. I take this issue very, very seriously, and I hope that we all do. Supplementary question. Speaker, seniors in long-term care needed protection months ago. Back in February, the Premier and the Treasury Board refused to put extra money into long-term care that the department was asking for. Yep. And again in June, the sector was begging the government for more resources, begging, begging for more support, and the Premier said no. Instead, the Premier waited for the second wave to hit and scribbled some numbers on a page. And he's still refusing to implement the recommendations of his own expert panel for higher wages and a minimum standard of care for every resident in long-term care. A new study confirms that the Premier's inaction in the spring actually led to needless deaths. Why is the Premier constantly, literally, waiting until people are dying before taking action. Mr. Blanchard, care. Thank you, Speaker. I, I do take exception to the characterization of the efforts uh, on, from the Premier. Uh, I look at his efforts with the PPE. I look at his efforts uh, ongoing. This is his top priority. There is no question in my mind, and all resources are being used. We continue to work to add more layers, to do more, working with the evolving information that is coming from the science and understanding this spread and being vigilant and adaptable. Our surveillance in the homes, looking at this, this, the type of spread as the evidence changes, working with our ethics table, working with our public health table, working with the science table. I want to impart the appreciation that I have for our Premier, Premier of Ontario, who has done nothing but support me, Bons. has done everything to support 
residents and staff, and you will be here hearing more this week about future efforts. Thank you. And the final supplementary. Well, Speaker, if the uh, Premier's top priority has been long-term care, and this is how he has uh, behaved, how he has treated the long-term care system and the people that live in it, we are in big, big trouble. Right. The Premier said yesterday that the numbers speak for themselves. He's absolutely right. 46 homes are currently in outbreak. Two more homes in Ottawa had to be taken over by hospitals because the for-profit profit operators couldn't handle what was happening in the homes. 1,867 seniors have died. My note said 1,866, although another person died just since this note was given to me this morning. When the Premier says the numbers speak for themselves, what numbers is he actually talking about? Because these numbers are horrifying and shameful and could have been Question. prevented. Members, will please take your seat. Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again for the question. Of the 78,000 residents in long-term care, uh, one-tenth of one percent are affected right now. We have 90 resident cases, and that perspective, Order. That perspective Order. needs to be understood that perspective needs to be understood. The majority of our homes that are considered in outbreak are considered in outbreak because they have either a case of a resident or a staff. And in the majority of our homes, the vast majority, there is not a single resident case. We will continue to add layers with this virus, the fight of all our lives. And I would appreciate if the opposition would understand and be part of the solutions. We're going to need all the energy we have to muster to fight COVID-19, not only in our long-term care homes, but across Ontario, and a collaborative effort when our energy needs to be at the best would be appreciated. Thank you. The next question, member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, Londoners are doing their part to limit the spread of COVID-19. They're following public health guidelines. They're lining up for hours to get tests for themselves or their children. But now the government is capping how many tests can be done in London. A leaked government memo states bluntly, do not proceed with any new growth or expansion of assessment centres at this time. Speaker, just two days ago, our local medical officer of health warned, Order. and I quote, we've had so many people that have been turned away or not even seeking testing because of the long lineups, and that means that there are certainly many times more cases in the community than we're able to diagnose right now, unquote. Speaker, why is this government capping testing in London instead of allowing assessment capacity to expand? Minister Bell. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. First of all, there is no one that needs a test that is going to be turned away. There is no capping. There is no quotas. Anyone who needs a test is going to be given a test. But there has been a lot of information, misinformation, I would say, about this, and I welcome the opportunity to provide some clarity. Speaker, with your indulgence, I would like to quote from the actual memo that went out from Ontario Health yesterday. In my supplementary, I'd like to provide further information about it. This is what it says, and I quote, anyone who needs to be tested per the guidance should get tested. There are no caps or quotas on testing consistent with the new guidance. Goes on to say, to that end, we are working with assessment centres on testing targets that are based on the historical utilization of tests in each region. A testing target refers to how many tests a region should need Response. based on what we've historically observed in each region. They also help us determine the number of tests coming to us and from where. Additionally, these tests go beyond anticipated need based on the ministry's new testing. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker. The memo also states, do not proceed with any new growth or expansion of assessment centres at this time. Speaker, this minister gave exactly the same answer to the people of Ottawa when my colleague raised this issue in this chamber yesterday. The government can pretend that its COVID response is fine, but its failure to plan for a second wave means that tests are being capped in both southwestern Ontario and eastern Ontario. The Premier knew that his government had struggled to complete even 20,000 tests a day in the spring. He knew that demands for testing would increase in the fall as students return to school and post-secondary education. He knew that a testing backlog has been growing, leaving people who do get a test waiting days for their result. Speaker, why does this government think it's acceptable to cut off the line and cap the number of COVID tests available to the people who need them? Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Neither the member for Ottawa South, nor the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, nor the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry have the floor. All of you have to come to order. Start the clock. The response, Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Just to complete what the uh, guidance note from Ontario Health said is, Ontario Health will continue to monitor testing volumes daily and adjust as needed in order to align with and support the ministry's guidance. So the answer is the same because the strategy is the same. We have uh, anticipated the need to, in to increase testing, which we've done. We're up over 40,000 tests per day. We're increasing our lab capacity and we're increasing our contact management. Order. We're putting a billion dollars into managing this. And so uh, what I need to say to the member and to the people of Ontario is the reason why this memo was sent out is so that we can continue to support and increase the guidance and testing as necessary. This is a very complicated system when you have volumes coming in from specimen all across the province from very different regions with lab, different labs doing the testing. In some cases Response. with the revised guidance, some where the test volumes are going down, some where they're going up. So we're trying to match the guidance with the specimens going into the labs, bearing in mind there is a three-day limit on the specimens. So what we're trying to do is to make sure we can continue to increase the testing. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Today is Rowan's Law Day, and Rowan's Law has helped keep athletes safe and protected against the severe impact of concussions, which are much more dangerous, Speaker, when they're neglected. I can say, as an athlete myself, understanding the pressures, it's not always easy as an athlete to take yourself out of the game due to an injury, particularly injuries others can't see, like a concussion. Would the minister please tell us what action our government's taking to change that culture in sport, because this is a very real issue, Speaker. Thank you. Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industry. Thank you very much, Speaker. I'd really like to say thank you to the member from Durham for raising this important issue today on the third annual Rowan's Law Day. Uh, and I think it speaks uh, volumes that, as an athlete herself, as she's committed to making sure that we have a safer entry and re-entry into sport for all Ontario young athletes. Earlier today, I had the opportunity to be at Sick Kids Hospital here in Toronto um, to mark a new announcement that the government is embarking upon. Obviously, it was quite emotional given that Rowan Stringer, my former constituent, died tragically at the age of 17 from second impact syndrome at the Children's Hospital in Eastern Ontario. Uh, we were able to announce last week with, uh, with the committed member from Ottawa West Nepean that we will be creating a national dialogue uh, with the next federal provincial ter territorial meeting of uh, sports ministers. In addition to that, we had an exceptional panel last night with a former uh, broadcaster and NHL, Eric Kiprios, former uh, NHL and Olympian Eric Lindros, and former CFL player, um, Tim uh, Fleiser uh, to talk about the impacts of concussion on young athletes. I'll have more to say in the supplemental, but today. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the minister for her work around Rowan's Law Day, and I want to thank Rowan for being for for sharing her story. Uh, it's a, a story that has inspired so many Ontarians. Speaker, and the message is this: If you're injured, stop and sit out. Minister, as many members are aware. Uh, our minister has 
uh, coached uh, her daughter's hockey team, and no doubt faced situations where young athletes want to play through injuries. Uh, Minister, uh, as not only a coach, but as a mother, um, what advice can you share with young uh, boys and girls that are playing sports in Ontario? Minister of Heritage. Thanks very much. Um, I think the first message would be from Gordon and Kathleen Stringer, who lost their daughter. Uh, her death was preventable. And so, therefore, it's important that we do uh, take every precaution we can, particularly with young minds. Um, I will say that our government is also committed to making sure that we support rural communities, which is why my colleague, the Associate Minister of Energy, yesterday made an announcement on my behalf for $25,000 to uh, rural communities for enhanced uh, support. Over the years, uh, our ministry has invested over $780,000 for concussion awareness and protocols. But today's speaker was very memorable because we were able to announce a $200,000 investment into a documentary in the name of Rowan Stringer to showcase her life, how it was preventable, and what I ask all parents to do is just because you paid the entry fee and I know it's expensive and you want your kid to play in that last tournament, if they have a concussion, it could be potentially fatal and it's just not worth it. And if Gordon and Kathleen Stringer could have been able to Response. prevent their daughter's death, I, I guarantee they would have. Thank you. The next question, the member for Key West North. Uh, question is to Premier. Uh, speaker, uh, communities across Key West uh, have been in crisis before COVID-19. Uh, the pandemic only uh, has only deepened these these crises. In the Skanaga, uh, there has been 20, 26 years of water boil advisories. To be exact, Mr. Speaker, 9,373 days without access to clean drinking water. Mm -hmm. In another community, 85% of the homes do not have running water. And uh, in the community of Obikka, there has been approximately 25 suicides over the last 30 years. What resources have been provided uh, by the government to these communities to help them with COVID? 19 pandemic. <clears throat> Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the uh, honourable member for his question and his statement uh, this morning. Mr. Speaker, um, just two years ago, uh, this government made it a priority to reset the relationships with Indigenous communities, to focus on things on the ground and in the community that could and would make a difference. Some of that is born from the experiences that I had living and working in many of those communities over the course of my career, and I appreciate the leadership of the Premier and the support of our caucus and this government, Mr. Speaker, in bringing some of those to fruition. Others, Mr. Speaker, was business that was unfinished from a previous government that had simply not put priorities where they mattered most, and that was in the communities. That's why we put a particular emphasis on major projects across northern Ontario. The east-west tie comes uh, to mind, the Wate Power Project, fundamentally improving Response. the fortunes and quality of life in those communities, Mr. Speaker. We remain committed uh, to improving the quality of life and investing in the Indigenous youth across northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you for the response. Again, uh, uh, I think uh, simple basic human rights as clean drinking water is uh, very basic that we need Ontario to invest in. <laughs> since I've been here, since I've been up north uh, growing up, I know governments come and go. Programs mm -hmm. come and go. Funding mm -hmm. comes and goes. And so that happens. As Ontario enters the second more serious wave of COVID-19, what is this government going to do to support these communities against the second wave? Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I have to say that um, during the first wave uh, and continuing today, not only have we had thorough and consistent engagement with the Chiefs of Ontario and their Leadership Council, uh, every single week, Mr. Speaker, I and many of my colleagues, uh, ministerial colleagues, have joined them. It's been much appreciated. Not all the conversations have been easy to the member opposite. Uh, there have been some difficult and tense moments. But underpinning that was the confidence that this government was committed to making sure and supporting the 
the uh, incredible leadership that Indigenous leaders have shown, from uh, Regional Chief Archibald to the Grand Chiefs, especially and including uh, Grand Chief uh, Alvin Fiddler with the bigger challenges of protecting isolated communities and the chiefs of those communities. I would say given the number of COVID uh, cases uh, in those communities, they and we have done a, con a great job. We will continue to remain engaged and make the priority investments to protect those communities. He has the word of the Premier and my word. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question, the member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, our, my question is to the Premier. Our COVID policies and the risk that they pose requires an honest and forthright discussion. Dr. Yeadon, a former chief scientist with the pharmaceutical giant Pfizer, has stated, and I quote, most if not all of the PCR tests result in false positives due to high CT thresholds. Juliet Morrison, a virologist at the University of California states, and I quote, any test with a cycle threshold above 35 is too sensitive. The Public Health Agency of Canada reported in May of this year that testing over 25 cycles provides dubious results. Oxford professor, the prestigious Oxford pr professor, Dr. Carl Hennigan, has stated a PCR test does not equal COVID-19. Speaker, my question to the Premier, question. is our, your testing creating both a false understanding of the risk as well as false positives. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. The uh, PCR testing is very effective in areas where there are outbreaks. It has proven to be so. We are receiving that information. We need that information in order to take action. We have taken action on several fronts in terms of limiting social unmonitored social gatherings, limiting uh, uh, capacities in restaurants and bars and in other actions that we've taken. But I'm not quite sure what the member is suggesting. Are you suggesting we don't do any testing? We don't. We just stop testing. Is that the the reaction that we should be taking with this? What else would you suggest? <laughs> Supplementary question. Back to the premier, and I'm glad that question was posed. On July 30th, the Deputy Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Barbara Yaffe, stated, and I quote: "Our testing can result in over 50% false positives. That is, the person actually doesn't have COVID. They have something else, or they have may have nothing." She has also called for limits on testing of asymptomatic people, while well, the government calls for more. Another contradiction in a long list of COVID contradictions. We know high false positive rates are due to high CTs, and Canadian and world experts agree it should not be more than 25 cycles. Yet, according to the Journal of Virology, Ontario labs are testing samples at 38 to 45 cycles. That's what needs to be done. Speaker, to the Premier, when did the Premier become aware Question. of these faulty tests and practices, and why have you done nothing to fix them since at least July? Minister of Health to reply. I would say to the member, there are zero inconsistencies coming from our public health experts. Dr. Yaffe has clarified what she indicated before. What she indicated before was that the 25. PCR testing is very effective in areas where we are having outbreaks, such as what we're seeing in various parts of the province right now, in Peel, in Ottawa, and in Toronto. We need that testing to make those decisions. The member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston will come to order. Restart the clock. Minister can conclude her answer. We are taking action where we need to take action. We're looking at other methods of testing as well. Some of the antigen testing is looking very promising. It looks as if Health Canada is going to be approving that. It's a good screening tool, but we need every tool that we can use at our discretion. PCR testing, antigen testing, we're looking at saliva testing. We need everything that we can do for screening and for testing purposes to keep the people of Ontario safe and healthy. The next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, I know that this summer you joined the Premier in finance and Minister of Finance to announce that our government has secured $2 billion in support from the federal government for our municipal partners. 
The first round of funding from your ministry has played a critical role in relieving the financial pressures the COVID-19 has put on our communities. Could you provide more details on the historic Safe Restart Agreement? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker. And I, I, I want to take this opportunity to thank the member for Perth Wellington, uh, not just for the question, but for the great work that he does in his riding. Yeah, he yeah. is so very close to his uh, municipalities and his municipal partners. Uh, I want to thank him for that. And, and as I've said in the House before, the Premier worked with our uh, municipal partners. Uh, other premiers, our, our Prime Minister, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland, to reach the historic $4 billion Safe Restart Agreement, which included $2 billion for our municipal partners. Uh, Mr. Speaker, $1.22 billion of that municipal support is coming directly from our, our government. And the funding, uh, as we all know, is addressing those municipal operating needs but it's also creating those more longer-term innovative housing solutions uh, and also supporting our public health costs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, $695 million in uh, municipal operating funding has flowed through phase one of the agreement, and there's an additional $695 million that's ready to flow for that second phase. I know that municipalities are, are keenly interested. They've been great partners, and we want supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your response. Uh, I know that this funding has been greatly appreciated across Ontario and certainly in my riding of Perth Wellington. Speaker, our government knows that this first round of safe restart funding will be, uh, will be sufficient to meet the needs of most of our municipalities. But of course, some communities have been hit extra hard and they will need access to the second round of funding. Could the minister provide more clarity on how and when municipalities can access the next round of funding? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker. Again, uh, thanks to the member. He's absolutely right. We know uh, collectively, because we've all stayed in constant contact uh, with our municipal partners, that for many of them, that first $695 million allocation was sufficient to address some of those uh, operating challenges that they had. But we, we also know that many of those communities need more assistance, and that's why Phase 2 will provide that much-needed $695 million. It'll be able to be given and demonstrated uh, demonstrated and given to those municipalities that show that need. Eligible municipalities uh, that will be applying for Phase Two funding will be informed of their additional allocations uh, in the very near future because we know that they certainly need that to deal with those municipal pressures. Uh, again, Speaker, we have been working with our municipal partners throughout the pandemic. I want to thank uh, members uh, from all parties and all sides of the House to, to ensure that we support them. I uh, am convinced, uh, Speaker, that our municipal partners, they will be leading the recovery in our province. Next question, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Encampments, some people are calling them board towns because they are the growing legacy of this Premier's heartless policies, continue to expand in many neighbourhoods in Toronto and across the province. Winter is coming and we are facing a humanitarian disaster. Cities can't cope on their own. There's simply nowhere for people to go. Shelters, respites and drop-ins are full. The government needs to step up to create tens of thousands of units of rent geared to income, affordable housing. It, it needs to create emergency shelters and hotel spaces immediately, accompanied by overdose prevention and harm reduction services and mental health supports, as well as the necessities of life for people in encampments now, washroom facilities, food and water, safe sources of heat and winter survival gear. COVID has vastly exacerbated what was already a homelessness emergency. When is the government going to act on this looming humanitarian disaster? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Speaker, uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much for the question. Uh, I've said many times in the House, we on, on this side of the House believe uh, every Ontarian uh, needs a safe and secure place to call home. Uh, I want to say to the member opposite, uh, through you, Speaker, that our government has acted. We've acted uh, both. Uh, in the budget this year, while we're providing almost a billion dollars uh, to help uh, sustain, repair, and grow our community housing system that was largely uh, neglected by the, the previous government. In addition to that, Speaker, uh, as part of uh, our announcements with uh, Minister Smith uh, and I, we've now 
uh, have provided to our municipal partners over $510 million uh, as part of that agreement to help uh, our most vulnerable. We continue to work collaboratively with uh, our federal government, Response. and I'll have more to say in the supplementary speech. The supplementary question. To make matters worse, housing experts are terrified of the eviction crisis they see on the horizon. They're expecting the numbers of people without housing to swell in the coming months by thousands or even tens of thousands. Most people who experience homelessness are Black or Indigenous. I am currently fighting to keep an Indigenous woman housed in Beaches East York. The same communities most impacted by COVID-19 are also the most likely to be pushed into homelessness. It is vital that Ontario both reinstate the residential moratorium on evictions throughout the pandemic and assist tenants directly with their rent payments so that they are not vulnerable to evictions down the road. Today, on Orange Shirt Day of all days, we need to hear, will the Premier allow evictions and Ford towns to continue to grow exponentially, or will he act now to keep people housed? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, speaker, again, I, I want to remind the member that our province was the first province or territory in Canada to sign on to the Canada-Ontario housing benefit because we realize that those that are most vulnerable, especially during the pandemic, uh, we need to ensure that we have dollars set aside collaboratively to work with all three levels of government. I want the member to know, and I want all members to know, that as part of the Safe Restart Agreement, we are encouraging every single service provider in our province to bolster their rent banks, to ensure that there is more money that's been allocated uh, through our social service relief fund and through the Safe Restart Agreement to ensure that as uh, the, the nights are getting colder, that those funds are provided directly to those that most need it. We will continue to work Response. with that members uh, uh, community here in the City of Toronto and all of our service managers to ensure that, that do those dollars that are allocated get to people who need it. Thank you. The next question, the member for Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. A very serious and alarming issue has come to my attention, with specific cases being confirmed to me. The Ministry's current directive is that only local public health units can order a classroom into isolation and can notify parents when there's a confirmed case of COVID in the classroom. Due to the local units being completely overbooked, overburdened, and struggling to keep up as it is, it can take days for this to happen. So, during those in-between days, children are going back into the classroom as usual. Parents are unknowingly sending their children into a classroom that has had confirmed exposure to COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, is the minister aware of this disturbing situation? How can the minister justify putting the lives of children and families at risk with such a poorly thought out and dangerous directive? Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. The public health guidance uh, is clear. We want students, all students and all staff, to self-assess before they enter schools. We provided a self-assessment tool for students launched with the, with the President of the Treasury Board to make it more accessible and easier for parents to understand the symptoms. We've also increased public health nurses to support uh, both screening in schools and likewise symptom relief for those children that have ailment. We've enhanced the amount of uh, flu vaccines being provided to more young people, 700,000 more have been ordered, $70 million, a historic investment by the province. Everything we're doing is to minimize risk, and I would continue to encourage parents to work with and listen to public health and their communities to ensure that those classrooms and those communities are safe. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Respectfully to the minister, that doesn't address the issue. The issue is the directive that it is only the, pub the public health units that can order the, um, the isolation when there's a confirmed case. So it's the gap between that the teachers and the children are going back into the classroom for several days after they know that they've been exposed. So there's the problem. What is the minister going to do about that directive? Mr. Um, speaker, students are encouraged to isolate if there is any symptoms. Public health will provide direction as per the outbreak protocol. In some circumstances, public health will require them to stay home for 14 days. The school board will pivot to online learning, as has been the case in each of the examples where we've seen uh, outbreaks affecting a cohort or a school. Uh, in the context of the protocol, 
Uh, Dr. Yaffe, Dr. Williams, and the entire COVID-19 command table are constantly refining the protocol. I spoke with the doc uh, Dr. Etches in Ottawa, uh, as well as the director and the uh, chair of the board in Ottawa region where the member represents. We are constantly looking for ways to improve the data flow, uh, as well as to improve the directive. And it's going to be done by our public health officials, by doctors, not politicians. We'll continue to take their advice, implement it province-wide. Next question, the member for Ottawa, West Nepean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Finance. Last week, I was proud to join the Minister of Finance, the member for Willowdale, and my colleagues from Ottawa Caucus on a virtual budget consultation with individuals from Ottawa's resilient business community. This town hall was an important opportunity for our government to hear directly from the people of Ottawa during these challenging times. I know this consultation will play a critical role in helping to ensure the challenges faced by Ottawa residents are addressed by our government as we continue to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and plan for an uncertain future. Mr. Speaker, this town hall provided an opportunity to hear about the important role Ontario has played in supporting people and businesses during this crisis. Could the parliamentary assistant please share with the House the actions our government has taken to support Ontario's small business community during the COVID-19 pandemic? Recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from the great riding of Ottawa, West Nepean. He's been an important voice and an incredible champion for the constituents in the Ottawa region. Here, here. Speaker, the, the member is correct. Hearing directly from businesses and community organizations like those in Ottawa is crucial to help uh, inform Ontario's economic rec recovery plan and get the stories behind uh, the numbers, Mr. Speaker. Our government has taken the necessary action to protect the health and well-being of the people of Ontario during this crisis because this is not just the right public policy, Mr. Speaker. It's the right economic policy. In March, the Minister of Finance introduced Ontario's Action Plan, the first phase of Ontario's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the time since, we've made additional investments in the fight against the virus by allocating more support for people, jobs, and a safe reopening and the response. response to the second wave. These investments bring our COVID response action plan to a projected $30 billion, up from the $17 billion as first announced. More to be done, Mr. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Well, thank you for that answer. It is heartwarming to know that our government is taking the economic recovery of Ontario so seriously. Mr. Speaker, it's clear to me that this government is committed to listening as we continue building our recovery plan. I am proud to be part of a government that is committed to consultation and collaboration. As Vice Chair on the Standing Committee of Finance and Economic Affairs, I have seen firsthand the value of broad and robust consultations in assessing the impact of COVID-19. Could the parliamentary assistant please share with the House the actions this government has taken to listen to the concerns of Ontarians as we plan for an economic recovery? Parliamentary assistant to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, the member is absolutely right. Uh, our government understands the value of that broad consultation from hearing firsthand from those on the front lines. And that's why we're asking Ontarians to tell us what they want to see in the fall 2020 Ontario budget. Since this pandemic began, Mr. Speaker, our government has engaged with an unprecedented level of consultation with the people of Ontario, and that includes businesses, labour groups, nonprofits, associations, and many others. We are listening because we are here to help. Earlier this year, our government established the Ontario Jobs and Recovery Cabinet Committee, and every minister in that committee established ministerial advisory councils to hear directly from key stakeholders and experts across the province on a variety of sectors. We also had MPPs from both sides of this House consult from across the province with local leaders and constituents. And I, too, Mr. Speaker, have been proud to work side by side with the member from Ottawa West Nepean on the Standing Committee of Finance and Economic Affairs, a committee which has met with over 195 hours, Mr. Speaker, and listened to 522 witnesses. This is all part. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoba. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic is proof that fast, reliable, and affordable internet is an essential service. Christopher Malte, a constituent of mine, has two kids. In their community of Goulet River, in, in, unlimited internet is not available. 
which left the multifamily with very few options at the height of this pandemic. Either pay hundreds of dollars extra for more internet or send their kids to the schoolyard to access Wi-Fi and do their online classes, even though the school is closed. Obviously, they chose a second option. If schools have to shut down again in the middle of winter, does the Premier expect the kids to still go out to access Wi-Fi, and does he expect the parents to pay hundreds of dollars extra to Question. have a few, a few more gigabytes of internet? The Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you very much for the question. I know the member opposite and I have talked many times about broadband and the need to expand that as fast as we can. And that is why our government started last year, before the pandemic, with an investment of $315 million in order to leverage up to $1 billion in investment in broadband in this province of Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, I know that I work with the Minister of Education closely, as well as many ministries now, on expanding those programs faster and sooner. I know it's going to be in our secondary schools this fall that they'll all have access to broadband. Mr. Speaker, I talk about this topic every day, and I ask the federal government to come to the table to help us expand faster and to more areas of the province of Ontario. This is critical in the times we live in, and we are Response. doing as much as we can, and there's more to come, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Mr. Mr. Speaker, you know, to the Premier again, people can't log into announcements because those dollars are not coming down to the communities. My colleagues and I have raised the lack of access to broadband with the previous Liberal government. To no avail. We have raised the issue to this Conservative government continuously since the election, again to no avail. We know the Ontario government needs to invest a billion dollars over the next 10 years to develop broadband infrastructure. Why won't this government work with the federal government and telecommunication companies to bring essential services to all Ontarians? The member from Timisiming Quakran quoted the Premier's words last week. I'm on this like a dog on a bone. Speaker, my question is to the Premier again. Why is this Premier chasing his tail on the broadband file? <laughs> Minister of Infrastructure. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, the member is correct that the Premier has said that there's no more important infrastructure we can do to change people's lives in the province of Ontario than to build the broadband. And that is exactly what we are doing. We are asking. We are asking the federal government to come to the table because they do regulate the telecommunications company. I spend large parts of my day talking to everyone, even people like yourselves that live in my riding that can't access internet. And we continue to work with the Ministry of Energy, Northern Development and Mines and Indigenous Affairs uh, to get the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation. They've invested in several projects in Northern Ontario, including Indigenous communities. Some of the projects um, are in Northeastern Superior Regional Broadband Network, a satellite bandwidth expansion Spons? project for remote First Nation communities at Lansdowne, Fort Hope, and Martin Falls. Mr. Speaker, Matawa was a $30 million project that the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, and the Premier and I were at last year to connect Northern communities. This is a Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. In recent weeks, we've heard disturbing instances of street racing and stunt driving. I understand that many fines were issued in Wasaga over the weekend and in Hamilton earlier this month. Mr. Speaker, dangerous driving is always a cause for concern. Motorists should know that under the Highway Traffic Act, stiff penalties are in place for those who choose to engage in dangerous driving behaviours. Speaker, could the minister please tell us what these penalties look like? Great question. Mr. Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Burlington for the question. Mr. Speaker, I was extremely disappointed to hear of recent stunt driving events, especially those that have garnered crowds, despite the advice from public health officials. This is reckless and irresponsible. I want to remind Ontarians that under the Highway Traffic Act, we have some of the toughest penalties in North America when it comes to speeding and aggressive driving. 
Drivers who are caught traveling 50 kilometers an hour or more above the posted speed limit or engage in other high-risk behaviors are liable to receive an immediate seven-day suspension and seven-day vehicle impoundment at roadside. Drivers also face a series of other severe post-conviction penalties, including a fine up to $10,000, a license suspension of up to two years for the first conviction, six demerit points, and a jail term of up to six months. Response. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Transportation reviews its policies on a regular basis, and if changes are necessary, we will make them. Well and the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and through you to thank the Minister of Transportation. I want to reiterate that events like that we saw in Wasega over the weekend are deeply concerning. Not only are stunt driving events a danger to all those on the road and in the community, they are a danger to our community in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Public health experts have indicated that these types of irresponsible gatherings are a danger to public safety through increased risks of COVID-19 transmission. That's why it's important to ensure that those who blatantly disregard the rules and put the health and safety of Ontarians at risk are held accountable. Can the Solicitor General explain what actions our government is taking to crack down on these types of irresponsible and dangerous events? Great question. System. Thank you, Speaker. And through you, I want to thank the member of Burlington for that question. And before I begin, I want to thank our dedicated members of the Ontario Provincial Police for putting a stop to the dangerous events that took place in Saga Beach. They are working on the front lines of community safety, addressing the changing nature of criminal behaviour that has become of COVID-19 as a result of COVID-19, while putting themselves at increased risk of exposure. Speaker, protecting the health and safety of Ontarians with regard to the threat of COVID-19 is our government's number one priority. And that's why we took decisive action in response to these larger private gatherings that are taking place that break the gathering limits, which have been put in place to protect us and stop the spread of this deadly virus. We have provided law enforcement with the additional tools needed to shut down these premises that are hosting these types of events, and we're establishing new minimum sentencing, minimum fine, sorry, of $10,000, the highest Response. in Canada for those individuals who organize those events. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker. Ontario is in the midst of two public health emergencies. The number of deaths from overdose is 35 to 40 percent higher than we've seen since the pandemic started, compared to last year's numbers, according to the chief coroner. In July, the City of Toronto reached a record high number of overdose-related deaths. 27 people died. The pandemic has made it harder to access help. Addiction is a health issue, and we need to treat it as such. We don't need an ideological government to pick and choose which lives are worth saving. Why has the Premier and his government refused to increase resources to save lives? Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. You're absolutely right. There are many Ontarians who, uh, during this COVID crisis, are being faced with significant mental health as well as addiction challenges. Uh, we did open our consumption treatment services sites uh, several years ago now. They're still uh, continuing to do their work, but we recognize that there's more mental health supports that we need to provide as well. There's a number of people that are experiencing experiencing anxiety, depression, and other issues that are leading, in some cases, to uh, addiction issues as well. But that's one of the reasons why we supplied over $27.75 million for the mental health and addiction system to expand more online and virtual uh, assistance to people in situations where they weren't able to access um, their appointments with their uh, in person with their advisors, both with respect to addiction as, as well as with mental health. So we know that we need. there's more that we need to do, and I will certainly speak to that in my supplemental, but thank you. Supplementary question. Back to the Premier. Speaker, we've heard all of this before. What the minister has failed to mention is that the government closed overdose prevention sites. We only have 16 supervised uh, consumption treatment sites for the entire province, and they've abandoned the Provincial Emergency Task Force. The federal government had to step in to act, but it's not enough. 
more people are dying than ever before. Speaker, I am angry for the families who have lost loved ones. We are sitting here debating, but these are real people. They deserve care. The government is speaking about supports that weren't adequate before the pandemic, and now we need it much more. Will the minister admit that the government inaction is costing lives? Mr. Bell. Well, we certainly recognize that more needs to be done, and with respect to the consumption and treatment services sites, municipalities can still apply to have a site located in their areas. We are still considering applications. That is still open. People, municipalities are still able to apply for that. So we are ready to expand consumption and treatment services sites. But with respect to mental health and addictions generally, just before we were struck with COVID, we released our mental health and addictions comprehensive plan, a roadmap to wellness, a plan to build Ontario's mental health and addiction system. That is something we're still continuing to build. It's as relevant now as it was when we launched it. We know there's more work that needs to be done and advancement of more services. We are dealing with that as we speak because we know that people need that help because alongside the COVID crisis, we Response. know there is a significant increase in mental health and addiction needs. It's not something we're going to wait until later to deal with. We need to deal with those issues now because mental health is equally as Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question, member for Ottawa, West Nepean. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Education. Last Friday, we celebrate the Day of franco ontarian I am proud that our government that our government supported franco ontarians including those who are leaving in my uh, in my writing. This week, I was very happy to see that our government took measures to recruit and maintain more, uh, um, um, more, more teachers who are qualified to teach in French. Can the minister tell us more about those measures and how it will improve our uh, education system? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the to my colleague for his uh, for his hard work. I'm very happy to see that our government took measures to uh, rep to respond to all the problems related to our education system and to try to improve. To, to try to improve the education and all the problems that uh, the teachers are facing when they have to teach in French. And we're trying to train more uh, teachers in teaching French. We're also trying to make sure that we hire more teachers who are able to teach in French. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the parliamentary assistant for his answer. Students in Ontario deserve the tools to learn in French, and teachers in French as a second language are essential in order to support Francophone culture. We know, I know, that the parliamentary assistant and the Minister of Education have recruited many partners and consulted with them in order to find solutions with the lack of teachers, francophone teachers. Can the parliamentary assistant give us more information on this plan? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you once again to the member of Ottawa West Nepean for this important question. We met with many representatives of uh, francophone institutions such as uh, school boards, uh, associations, and uh, all those that are working to improve the francophone education system. We'd like to thank them for their efforts. We've created a partnership with the Laurentian University to provide a training for francophone teachers and we're also working with the York University to re to promote outreach programs and to promote francophone
teaching as a potential career. We continue our collaboration with the different associations and groups to ensure that all students can have access to quality French education. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This week I heard from Loretta Gibbons, whose brother Gerald and his wife Lucy live at a supportive living home in Niagara named Lakeside Terrace. Lake Lakeside Terrace, like other supportive living accommodations across Ontario, is a completely unregulated group home that more often than not has horrific conditions. Gerald and his wife have major health issues, including dementia, and are pensioners on a fixed income. Loretta sent me a desperate email along with pictures of unlivable conditions. She said there have been bed bugs for at least a year and the food served to residents is rotten. Because the homes are unregulated, bylaw enforcement is, able to do it, is unable to do anything. When they complained, the owner said, feel free to move out. Why is this government allowing Ontario citizens like Gerald and Lucy to live in unregulated, substandard conditions? Parliamentary assistant. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for this important question. Uh, this is an issue that I take personally as well uh, as an important issue because my brother lives in a congregate care setting, and I know that our government is committed to ensuring that those in our congregate care settings are provided the protection and services they need. Our government took immediate action to protect our province's most vulnerable and the frontline staff who care for them in residential settings. Through the COVID-19 Action plan for vulnerable people, we implemented measures that will help to stop COVID-19 at the door of these facilities through measures like enhanced screening and use of PPE, and manage outbreaks when they do happen, which included enhanced testing and contact tracing. This plan builds on our previous investments, including up to $40 million Spons. to support organizations that provide residential services like our developmental services agencies. And I look forward to providing more information in the supplementary. Supplementary question. Speaker, Speaker, the real problem is that these homes are unregulated. That's the issue. I proposed a private member's bill 164 that will protect residents from these abusive conditions. Members of the Premier's own cabinet supported this bill in 2017, including the Solicitor General. Many people who have complex needs but who don't qualify for and can't get into long-term care end up in these supportive living homes that claim to offer housing with supportive services and amenities typically provided in full-service retirement care. Owners have free reign to take advantage of vulnerable seniors who have no other options and frequently no one to advocate for them. We have seen fires, injuries and several deaths as a result of no regulation. Will the Premier commit to regulating these homes and ask his members to pass my Bill 164, protecting vulnerable persons in support of living? And the parliamentary assistant, once again, the reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the supplementary question and for the member opposite's interest in this important file. The COVID-19 Residential Relief Fund that our government introduced covered eligible costs such as additional staffing, residential respite for caregivers, and personal protective equipment and supplies. We have also, as a government, made several very important emergency orders, including providing flexibility so staffing and resources can be redirected to essential tasks, requiring that staff work for a single employer within that sector and limiting staff to working at a single site in an outbreak to prevent the spread of COVID-19. As the situation continues to evolve, our government remains committed to protecting our most vulnerable citizens, uh, and I thank the member opposite for that question. Thank you. And that concludes question period for this morning.